Welcome back. We left off last time. We finished up John 3 through verse 15. So now we're ready to take up John 3, 16. This is... This is, again, part of what we call the Nicodemus Discourse. That is Jesus' teaching in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. Who Nicodemus is is not at all unimportant to this text because a lot of it is going to stand in stark contrast to what Nicodemus, as a ruler of the Jews, that is to say, as a, is a rabbi, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, he's all of those, is going to expect out of God. And again, this is not some pagan. It's not some, some crazy pagan in Athens who pours out libations to Demeter and Athena. This is someone who has the Bible. Meaning, he should know better. So let's, um, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, as we take up this beloved chapter of your holy scriptures, we thank you for revealing these things to us which flesh and blood could not have revealed. We thank you for sending your spirit into us that we may know you. So may your word, as, as you promised, not return to you void, but accomplish that which you propose, namely, the bestowing and strengthening of the faith by which we are reckoned righteous before you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So last week we talked about the first part of the Nicodemus Discourse, which is you must be born from above. You must be reborn. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Again, as we talked about, especially from Ezekiel 36, this is something that the Pharisees should have known, but didn't. <clears throat> Before we start with verse 16, it's not, it's not a real giant point, but it is worth noting. It's not made exactly clear in the text if this is a continuation of Jesus' speech or if this is John adding a little aside in the text. So it may be that these words were spoken by Jesus. It may be that they were written by John about Jesus. However, we also know that the whole of the Bible is the word of the Lord. And when we say the Lord, we mean what? Jesus. So whether it was actually spoken by Jesus or whether it was written by John about Jesus, they are, in fact, in truth, the word of the Lord. Which is why I say it's not a giant major point. Okay, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Obviously, this is, of all Scripture, some of the most beloved text, right? This is, <clears throat> this is the text you go to in the middle of the night when the devil is screaming in your ear and you want to be reminded of the goodness of God. Why is this the verse everyone goes to? It's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's simple. We all know it. It's short. It says it all. So on the one hand, everybody goes here. On the other hand, there's a good reason for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows this text. We teach it to our kids from the time they're very young. And again, with reason. 
It's not just because we're stupid and we're not advanced enough to go to a better text. There's a reason Christians have always loved this verse. Because it, it encapsulates the whole of the gospel in a very short manner that's easy for us to, 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 com- to, to think about. Now again, this is very typical of how John works because the words themselves are very simple. The grammatical construction is simple. The vocabulary is simple. In the Greek, there's really not any, <clears throat> there's not any kind of issue with translation with the exception of maybe one word. It's, and which word is it, by the way? It's the word so. We'll get there. Um, so on the one hand, the, the language itself is very simple. Greek students love John because John's words are easy. However, what? John's gospel is far from shallow. Typically, simple language means shallow thinking, especially if you you happen to be like a Greek. But there's nothing shallow about this at all. This is the kind of well that Christians go back to again and again and always find more and more. So let's, let's go through it. Jesus has just told Nicodemus that just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus is already talking about the cross. We don't really think about Jesus without thinking of the cross. Even on Christmas, we have to talk about what was this baby born to do. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give a second birth. By the way, that's a really great hymn theologically. It's not just great musically. The theology of that hymn is amazing. Um, already when he's, when he's born, Mary is told he's, he's, he's appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and a sword will pierce your own heart as well, meaning... She's going to be present at the cross and see her own son die. And so you can't think of Jesus without also thinking about the cross. That's very important when we get to this word, so. This English word has roughly 30 million meanings. I'm, that may be an estimate. Typically, you'll hear this verse explained as God loved the world so much that. That's really not what the word so is doing here. Now, that's not theologically wrong. It is, it is a right statement to say that God loved the world so much that he gave. But the word here... Uh, in Greek, it's going to be hutos. It really means thusly. Now, while I might like thusly, you all probably don't use that word a lot. It's going to mean something like, in this manner. In this specific way, did God love the world? That tells you a lot about the nature of God's love. It's not just like he looked down on us like we're a bunch of fluffy kittens and goes, aw. Now, the Father does have a tender heart toward us. It's one of the reasons the devil hates us so much. Why could God love creatures like that? Moral beings that rebelled? We angels didn't get any salvation. But understand that God's love here is described not so much as a feeling in the heart. It's described as a what? And an action. In what way did God love the world? The following way, colon, He sent His only begotten Son. 
There also is an issue about, about which text gets used to translate this. The word really ought to be only begotten, not merely only. ESV uses more critical text to translate things. I don't understand that. The NIV does the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of a, of a good text that does not use only the box. Right. Mono, like a mono rail, it means one rail, right? Only or one. Ganes, like genealogy, right? It's clear. So, it's a fairly clear word. So why didn't the Lutheran fathers that were putting together this Lutheran Bible? The translation in your Lutheran study Bible was not done by Lutherans. No, it was done by mostly Reformed persons. Um, that was the ESV that came out in 2001. And the problem with academics is they like to be smart. And so, oh, well, we have better texts available to us now than they did during the benighted days of the King James. Well, the King James was right. There's, there's always the question about Bible translations because you could make a Lutheran Bible translation, but actually the whole point of Sola Scriptura is... you. Yeah, it, 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 it starts to be a little sectarian, and then you start to read your theology into the text, which when, what you're supposed to do is get your theology from the text. It's always a temptation. Um, so, New King James, King James will have only begotten. NIV, ESV will have only. Did everyone hear that? It's, it's not a minor point. Does God only have one son? No. He has one son that is begotten of the Father. We are his sons, not by having been begotten from the Father, but by adoption through Christ. What does it mean that he gave his only son? Yeah, exactly. Where he stayed the hand of Abraham, he did not stay his own, meaning he gave him unto death. Not merely that he sent him, he gave him in death. And now the, 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 next, the next point makes it very clear. What's the point of his death? Why did Christ die? Yeah, so that whoever believes in him, what? Should not perish but have eternal life. Meaning, <laughs> the point is that Christ has come to fix a specific problem, <clears throat> namely the problem of death. He has fixed death by entering into death and becoming victorious over death by his atoning sacrifice on the cross. What's the Father's role in this? He's the one who gave the Son. Put a, put a bookmark or something in John 3. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2 verse 3. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this is God. We, you only know God's will when He reveals it, right? And there's a lot about God's will that he doesn't reveal. But here, he specifically reveals his will regarding all people. What is God's will for all people? Namely, that they be saved. How is that related to John 3.16? God so loved what? The world, right? And he desires that all people be saved. So God gives his son into death and he dies for the whole world. No asterisks, no exceptions. He died for the Romans that are driving the spikes through his hands. He died for the Jews who gave him up into death. He even died for the one who betrayed him. 
All right, back to John 3. <clears throat> knowing that then, knowing that it is God's will that all be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, notice that, that, that Jesus here describes his death in both a positive sense and a negative sense. That is, that whoever believes in him should, negative, not perish, positive, but have eternal life. So, unless, lest it be unclear what's meant by have eternal life, you can define that by saying not perish. Now, of course, we all know that we, we die. Rich, poor, no matter what time you live in, we all die. And yet what? And yet we don't die, right? When, it, when we sing all of those Gerhard hymns during Eastertide, how does Gerhard always describe death? A portal. That's exactly the word. I always joke about it because there's like only one word that rhymes with portal, and so if the, the next verse will have something about immortal, right? Only, only so many ways you can rhyme portal. But a, a portal is a doorway, right? Death is now not the enemy that conquers us. Now death has been transformed into the door by which we enter into eternal life. not perish, but have eternal life. Unless John 3.16 be too unclear, although it is very clear, John 3.17 says exactly the same thing as John 3.16, but in the negative. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. This is an important point because once people realize who Jesus is, they're often terrified. Think of the disciples in the locked room after Easter. The doors are locked being, you know, for fear of the Jews. Jesus comes and stand among, stands among them. The first thing he says is, peace be with you. Why? They all either betrayed him or ran. And so their first thought is, oh, that one we ran away from, that one we denied, that one we rejected, he's now standing in front of us. He's come for revenge. Which is why Jesus doesn't even allow them to entertain the thought. He says, peace be with you. So whatever Jesus has to say, it's, it's for the purpose of peace, not for the purpose of destruction. Because remember, that Jesus is God is not good news until you know what his will is. That's why we have to be told. Because again, God is our judge. We're going to be judged by Christ. And that would be a very frightening thing because, of course, as God, he is perfectly holy. And we are sinners. Isaiah knew this when he saw the vision of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm sunk. So John tells us, or, or Jesus tells us, Jesus came into the world, but not to condemn it. But rather what? In order that the world might be saved through him. So the question is, if, if we repent and we ask God to forgive our sins, and God, of course, hears that prayer and forgives our sins, and forgets our sins, on what basis are we judged? Believe it or not, that's exactly what comes next. Verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So the, the judgment is now based upon this whether or not the person believes in Jesus. 
So the judgment for the believer is going to go like this. Satan has his accusations, but of course those are all stopped. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of the accusations of of the law are answered in the blood of Jesus. So it starts to look like what Jesus describes in Matthew 25, where this person is one of mine and I can prove it. I was in prison and they visited. I was thirsty, they gave me drink. I was hungry and they gave me food. So our good works are proclaimed aloud as evidence of the faith by which we're judged. Now, when has our sin entered into evidence? Never. The record is wiped clean. As far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your sins from you. So it's, it's, it's not a scale of, do you have enough good works to overcome your sin? The sins are not entered into evidence. They're answered entirely in the blood of Christ. And so now your good works, your good works are not used to judge. The basis of the judgment is, is a single point, faith in the Son. The good works are entered into as evidence of that faith. And by the way, that judgment is pronounced, yes, on the last day, but it's also pronounced on earth. It's actually the topic of our sermon today. Um, that when, when God's servant says, I forgive you all your sins, that is God pronouncing judgment on you. God has spoken, and the verdict is this, your sins are forgiven. So that on the last day at the judgment, there will be no surprises. You know what the verdict is already because he's pronounced it on earth. He's already told you the judgment. Your sins are forgiven on account of Christ. So that's, that's the basis. But then immediately the question is what? This has been addressed in every era of the church. In Latin, the question is, cur alii alii non, why some, not others? If God died for the sins of the whole world, and he did, if it truly is the will of God that all men be saved, and it is, we know from the Bible that the bulk of the world is not saved. So why? Well, Jesus tells us. Verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. We're back to that theme that we saw way back in, I say way back, it's just two chapters ago, but you know, four months ago. (laughs) Back in John 1, we introduced the theme of light and darkness, right? Jesus is the light that has come into the world that's full of darkness. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not understood it or overcome it. Why are some saved and not others? The reason is is not because there was anything deficient about the light. The light is good. The light is truly light. However, wicked men loved the darkness, which is to say they preferred the darkness to the light. They, or they hide in the darkness because the light will expose them. Now, there will come a day when everything will be brought into light. Right? It's like turning up all the house lights at a bar. 
And, and you start to, to realize that, wait a minute, this place is kind of dingy. <laughs> it doesn't look that, that way when there's not much light going on. There will come a day when all the lights are turned on and everything that has been hidden in darkness will be exposed. Both for good or for evil. The, the good works that we did that no one else knew about, Jesus will proclaim that to the whole creation as evidence of our faith. That's one of the reasons why we don't need to seek credit for everything that we do. Jesus knows that the judgment is now based on faith. And there are men, most of the world, who preferred the darkness to the light because their, their, their ways were evil. To them, the idea of standing in front of a holy God and saying the words, I, a poor, miserable sinner, are unthinkable. What this means is that, one, why do people go to hell? It's their own fault. They loved the darkness. To put it another way, they preferred the darkness. This, yeah, this is Romans 1, right? No one is without excuse. Creation itself bears sufficient witness about God that there is no one who is without excuse. Why are some saved and not others? Christ came for all. It's God's will that all be saved. So in other words, the blame for anyone going to hell does not go to God. It's not to say God did not will this person to go to heaven. We just saw in 1 Timothy 2, it is God's will that everybody go to heaven. It is God's will that all be saved. And it's not that Jesus didn't die for all. God so loved the world. By the way, that, that word world there is not just the earth. It's not just the land. The word there is cosmos. It's in the accusative, so it's cosmon, but it's from the word cosmos, right? You remember Carl Sagan and his turtleneck talking about billions and billions and billions of stars, right? I think the Sagan is the SI unit for stars now, right? And, and he, he was the host of the show Cosmos because he was talking about the whole universe, right? That's that Greek word that, that is translated here as world. And that, that's a fine translation. There's nothing really wrong with that. But understand that that word world does not in any way have room for exceptions. Christ did, in fact, die for all. By the way, that's tremendous comfort because you, your, your faith is based on a syllogism. Remember back in logic class, premise one, Christ died for all. Premise two, I am part of all. Conclusion what? Christ died for me. You never have to wonder, did Christ die for you? He died for all. Are you part of all? Well, yeah. So, we also have to deal with the reality that most will not be saved, which is to say most will that they not be saved. They preferred the darkness to the light because their deeds were evil. They, didn't want, they did not want to be exposed. And it's a tremendous, tremendous heartbreak for those of us in the light because we know there is forgiveness in him. That the ones who reject Jesus, Christ died for them. Why not repent of your sins? She, they don't want to. And so you can be as skillful as possible. You can be as winsome as possible. You can be as nice and patient as possible. And you should. But if men prefer the darkness, you can't really argue them into the light. What can we do? We can set the light before them. But many reject. So... Who gets the glory for those who go to heaven? God alone. 
God gets the glory for anybody going to heaven. It is His work. Those who go to hell, it's their own fault. Turn the other cheek is about, um, is about answering a persecutor. That's actually not what turn the other cheek means. Um, so most people think turn the other cheek means become a doormat. It kind of doesn't. It's more like, oh, you're going to hit me in the face because I belong to Christ here. Give me another one. Come on. You can't touch me. You can't do anything to me. You, kill me. That just brings me nearer to my God. Go ahead. Give me another one. It's, it's, it's answering. And it's, yes, I, you know what? I like it. Righteous taunting. <laughs> go, yeah, yeah. Go, go trademark that. That's, that's the thing is, is by being kind to them, you heap coals on their head. Because no one can say, well, okay, sure, but it's because you were a jerk. But if you, if you, if you don't provoke, right, then, and, and furthermore, as you know, by being holy in the presence of a wicked person, it bothers them. Oh, you think you're better than me. I never said that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. You're holier than thou. Don't get me wrong. There are people like that. The, the Pharisees get that reputation for a reason. But understand, people hate, the, people hate the light. And if you belong to the light, and if you reflect the light of Christ in your own life, those who love the darkness are going to hate you too. Their, their problem is that you exist. And of course, the devil will say, well, maybe you should have been nicer. Maybe you should have rolled over a little more. Those who love the darkness hate the light. And if, and if you belong to Christ, the light is visible to those around you, both to the Christians who love the light and to the unbelievers who hate the light. Yeah, the, the, the world will tell them how to be Christians and, and the church will go, okay, okay, we'll change. Just, just come in, please. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll stop talking about the, the gay stuff. We'll, we'll give up on that. I mean, Lutheran Church of Australia just, what, in the last 48 hours voted to ordain women. Yeah. There was a confessional church body. There was a progressive church body. They merged in 1966. Bad idea at the time. Missouri tried to warn them. They didn't listen. And now here they are in the year of our Lord 2024. They voted to ordain women. But, you know, but again, you know, hey, Australians, we know you're big into egalitarianism, so we'll just give up. We'll ordain women. See, look, we're not mean. We're not like, we're not crazy fundies. Please love us. The problem is not that we weren't good at being Christians. That's the accusation from the devil. The problem is the people who love the darkness hate the light. Do, do pray for the Lutheran Church of Australia. Um, I, I would not be surprised to hear about a new church body being formed from those who, who dissented. Well, it's, it was a death by a thousand cuts, and I saw this back in the ELCA. Uh, we just want a study document, that's all. We're just going to study this. You know what? It's okay to say, no, we're not studying this. God's Word is clear. We're not having a dialogue. We're not going to sit down and have a conference and talk about this. It's not something that we're permitted to talk about. This is evil. And, and that's, not, that's not unique to one church body. I mean, when, when Concordia, Texas separated themselves, probably illegally, from the Synod, what was the first thing they did? They made a woman their president, because the bylaws of the Missouri Synod say that, that we don't do that. And then they, they've, they've announced already that they formed a group to institute DEI in Concordia University in Austin. So, so for what purpose were they seeking to separate themselves from the Synod? Now you know. So they could have a woman president and put in a DEI commission, whereas the Missouri Synod wouldn't have allowed that. So they can hide in the darkness, right? Yeah, it's, it's not because he's like me and has a bad memory. It's, he, he chooses to forget. He chooses to wipe them clean. Hey, Thomas. Look at verse 21 real quick. And this, this was a point we talked about earlier. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The Christian does not fear the judgment. Because at the judgment, your works will be revealed. That should not frighten you. Because as a Christian, by definition, you will have good works carried out in God, great or small. 
and your good works, whether they be great or small, will be made known to the whole creation. Jesus will say, this one is one of mine, look at this. We should not fear, though, because God has, in Christ, forgiven all of our sins. So the sins are not revealed, because the sins are answered already. What remains is the good works. For that reason, we don't fear the judgment. We don't fear the light. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. ask Adam. You can't hide from God anyway. I was afraid I wasn't going to have enough material, so I prepared to the end of chapter 4. Uh, turns out that wasn't a problem. All right, so uh, next week we'll take up more on John the Baptist, and uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you all.